Hello, friends. Welcome back to this series where we go through and explain the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. Last time, we show how to compose a total angular momentum state out of two constituent states. This is how angular momenta add up in quantum mechanics. Then we went on to give a few examples of how this affects the spectral lines of atoms. In fact, this was the reason why Niels Bohr invented his famous model in 1913 to explain the atomic spectral lines. The key idea is that electrons can only occupy certain discrete orbits around the nucleus instead of the full continuum and can only make discontinuous jumps between them while emitting radiation, which explains the discrete sets of spectral lines. This is an indirect consequence of the Bohr's model. Naturally, physicists back then were also wondering if there were a more direct way to observe these discrete orbitals. This led to the famous stern gerlach experiment. This experiment, done in 1922 by Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach, was designed precisely for the purpose of verifying directly the orbitals of an electron in the atom. Here's how it works. An atom, which is overall neutral in charge, can nevertheless have a magnetic moment mu due to the motion of its electrons. And not just that, the spin of the electron also contributes to the magnetic moment, as we have shown in the last lecture. Together, the total effects of the electron's orbital motion and intrinsic spin gives rise to the magnetic moment, as expressed in this formula where j is the total angular momentum of the electron, and m its mass. The g factor is determined by other effects from quantum electrodynamics. We gave an intuitive derivation of this formula in the last lecture. Go watch it if this is unfamiliar to you. This being quantum mechanics, j here is an operator in Hilbert space. As we have shown in the last lecture, the energy states of an electron in an atom are also the eigenstates of its total angular momentum. More precisely, they are the eigenstates of both the square of J and its third component. These are the states J M, which we have spent the last lecture constructing. Here we change the notation of M into sigma to avoid confusion with the electron's mass. And here's the crucial point of the experiment. By using an external magnetic field, we will be able to distinguish these different angular momentum states through the interaction with the associated magnetic moment given by this formula. Let's assume for the purpose of illustration, there's only one electron in the atom, and only its spin contributes to the magnetic moment. This means there's only two spin projections along any axis. This is incidentally quite close to the actual experiment, since they were working with silver atoms, which has only one outermost electron. The rest of the inner electrons are all paired up, with their spins in opposite directions, cancelling each other. Why this is so is due to an important principle, which will be explained later in this chapter. The setup is like this. We send the atom through a magnetic field, that is oriented in the z-direction. This magnetic field is not exactly uniform, and this is by design. We shall explain its purpose in a moment. A screen that measures the location of the atom at the end of its trajectory. Note that this representation of the magnets is only a schematic, just a simplification to make this diagram easier to read. More accurately, they look like this. It turns out that all the atoms that were sent through in a beam ended up around two dots on the screen. This suggests that they all travel along only two distinct trajectories. Intuitively, this will fit the theory. The upper trajectory will correspond to the spin up along the z-axis, while the lower trajectory spin down. Please note that when the original experiment was being conducted, the electron spin has not yet been proposed. Even so, considering just the orbital angular momentum, the observation of only a discrete number of trajectories 
provides a more direct proof of Bohr's discrete orbitals. But from the perspective of classical physics, this makes no sense. In the original experiment, these atoms all came from a heated oven and would have been oriented randomly due to thermal agitations. Therefore, the marks on the screen should have been smeared out, corresponding to all the different orientations. Yet only two dots were seen. This result would seem puzzling for a classical physicist. A quantum mechanical treatment is required, which is what we will do now. Let's begin with this Hamiltonian, which describes the time evolution of the atom as it moves through the magnetic field. As usual, the first term is the kinetic energy operator, which governs its free motion. Capital M is the mass of the atom. For the interaction, we include only the coupling of the electron's magnetic moment with the external magnetic field B. Note that this is the field experienced at the atom's location, therefore its argument is the position operator of the atom. The fact that the atom is overall neutral in charge works in our favor, since it then wouldn't experience the Lorentz force due to its motion in the magnetic field, which would have overwhelmed the coupling with the magnetic moment that has a direct connection with the electron's orbitals that we are trying to measure. Using this Hamiltonian, let's work out how the atom evolves in time. Let's start with the Heisenberg's picture where it's the operator which represents the observables that change in time while the state vector of the system remains the same before and after the process. Later in our calculation, we'll also use the Schrodinger's picture where instead it's the state vector that evolves in time. Reasoning with both pictures will greatly simplify our work, as we'll see in a minute. If you are unfamiliar with the Heisenberg's and the Schrodinger's picture of quantum mechanics, see lecture 4. To figure out how the position operator evolves in time, we use the Heisenberg's equation of motion. Before we evaluate the commutator on the right hand side, first note that although the Hamiltonian itself is time independent, since the magnetic field and the setup of the experiment do not depend on time explicitly. The dynamical variables of the atom, which are its position, momentum, and the angular momenta of its electron, do depend on time. It's just that their composition into the form of H is an operator that is constant in time. This gives us the freedom to set the time argument of the dynamical variables within H to whatever values we wished and we chose them to coincide with this t, the instant when we need to know the atom's velocity. And the reason for this is that we could then use the canonical commutation relation, which only holds between x and p when their time coincide, to evaluate this commutator. And using the product rule of commutators and the relation in the yellow box, this just evaluates to the gradient of h, Note that this gradient is taken with respect to the atom's momentum. Of course, all the dynamical variables within this last term are still time dependent. We are just hiding their time argument to simplify our notations. If you are unfamiliar with the product rule of commutators, please refer to lecture 2. They are very similar to the product rule of derivatives, which is why we end up with a derivative. Evaluating this derivative is easy if we assume that the interaction term is independent of p. So we just end up with the velocity operator equals to p over the atom's mass. But why could we just assume that the interaction term to be independent of p? Doesn't the magnetic moment depends on the electron's angular momentum, which could depend on p? We'll explain this in a moment. For now, let's first evaluate the time derivative of p. This is similar to the calculation we have just performed. But this time, with a derivative with respect to position instead. 
with an additional minus sign. Those of you familiar with the Hamiltonian formalism of classical mechanics may recognize these as the Hamilton's equations. These are the equations of motions of the dynamical variables x and p of the system. Except now, these are operators instead of ordinary variables, and we call them Heisenberg's equations of motion. Because the classical equations are virtually identical to the quantum ones, back when the stern galak experiment was first performed in 1922, given just the initial conditions set by the discrete orbitals of Bohr's theory. The two physicists were able to describe the discrete number of trajectories observed in the experiment without using the quantum mechanics of Heisenberg and Schrödinger, which was only formulated in 1925. Let's now calculate the gradient on the right-hand side of this equation. From here on, when we write the gradient without specifying if it's with respect to x or p, it's x by default. This position gradient would not affect the free part of the Hamiltonian and will only act on the interaction term. Note that as always, we are using the Einstein's convention, where repeated indices are summed over. The magnetic moment operator could actually be moved out of the position derivative, even though it depends on the electron's total angular momentum by our earlier formula. The reason for this is because J is actually defined with respect to the center of the entire atom, while X and P describe the overall center of mass position and momentum of the atom. Therefore, we are really talking about independent degrees of freedom. This picture should illustrate what we mean. The center of mass position, xcm, is measured with respect to the lab reference frame. The center of mass of the atom is practically at the center of the nucleus, as the nucleus mass is very much larger than the electrons. We have discussed all these in lecture 16. The position of the electron with respect to the nucleus is given by this small x. So the capital X and P we have been talking about are the center of mass position and the total momentum of the atom. These two form a canonical conjugate pair, while little x and P form another pair of relative variables of the electron with respect to the nucleus. These two sets are independent variables, and because they are operators, this means they commute with each other. J is made up of these relative variables, more precisely, with the addition of the electron spin. As a result, J is an internal variable of the atom and commutes with both the center of mass X and P. The reason we only consider the magnetic moment due to the relative motion of the electron with respect to the nucleus is this. The center of mass motion where both the electron and the nucleus move together with respect to the lab frame is the motion of a neutral atom, and therefore we could ignore its interaction with the external magnetic field. But the independent relative motion of the electron with respect to the nucleus cannot be cancelled out in the same way. Let's get back to our calculation of the equations of motion. Let's combine these two equations. We can replace this momentum using the first equation. And we have a second order differential equation with x as the only center of mass variable. Now we want to look at the average position of the atom and see how it moves in time. We do this by sandwiching this equation between the state vector of the atom. Remember that we are in the Heisenberg's picture, so psi is independent of time. All the time dependents are in the operators. This means we could just bring psi into the time derivatives. 
This bracket will give us the average trajectory of the atom. We now tidy up the expression for the magnetic moment. This can be written as jk over the h-bar in the denominator is a dimensionless combination. Therefore, mu is a parameter that has the dimension of magnetic moment. The j in the denominator is just the angular momentum quantum number of the electron. We can see that this new parameter, mu, is simply the maximum projection of the magnetic moment along any axis for an electron orbital j sigma. For example, take the third axis and apply this to a j sigma state. The operator mu3 has its maximum eigenvalue when sigma is equal to j, which is the maximum projection of the angular momentum along the third axis. Thus mu is the maximum projection of the magnetic moment along the third axis, or along any axis for that matter since the quantum number j is rotationally invariant. Here's a side note about angular momentum in quantum mechanics. If we look at the range of allowable values of sigma for a fixed j along, say, the z-axis, the maximum value of sigma would only reach j But this is not quite the square root of the eigenvalue of the square of the angular momentum operator, which is how we would have defined the magnitude of angular momentum. This subtle feature is the signature of angular momentum in quantum mechanics, where all the components of this vector cannot be simultaneously known, since they don't commute with each other. From here on, we shall work with this expression for the magnetic moment. The parameter mu can be considered as a property of the atom we are studying. Coming back to the stern galak experiment, we now need to decide what sort of magnetic field to apply. Remember that we are trying to access the angular momentum states of the electron in the atom. A key property is the projection of j along a chosen axis. But how do we choose this axis? As we shall see, this turns out to be precisely the direction of the applied magnetic field. Just by convention, let's take this to be the third axis. Let's express the magnetic field in two parts, a uniform part and the inhomogeneous part that depends on position, b1. We shall often express the components of B1 like so. Let's set the uniform magnetic field to be along the third axis. This field is just an ordinary number and not an operator. We let B0 to be the dominant part of the magnetic field, with its magnitude much larger than the magnitude of the average value of B1. Of course, this average is taken with respect to psi, the state vector of the atom. In practice, this means we shall treat B1 as a small quantity, and keep it only to the first order in any calculation. This would greatly simplify things. Going back to our equation of motion, let's make the time argument of all the operators explicit. Even this gradient is taken with respect to x of t. At this point, we switch to the Schrodinger's picture. Recall that for the brackets of operators with respect to the state vector, such as these two, it doesn't matter if we use the Heisenberg's or the Schrodinger's picture, these quantities are independent of the picture we use to view time evolution. For example, let's look at the average position starting in the Heisenberg's picture. We can make the unitary time evolution explicit. 
How we distribute this unitary evolution determines the picture. We could have grouped the unitary operators with the state psi. This is then the Schrodinger's picture, but the value of the average position remains the same. So we can simply move the time dependence from operators to the state psi in these two brackets. And we now have the equation of motion for the average position in the Schrodinger's picture. Let's now work out this derivative. This acts directly on the inhomogeneous field B1. And because the dominant uniform field B0 vanishes under the derivative, this term is small and is on the same order of magnitude as B1, so we shall keep it only to the first order. To proceed further, we need some specific function for B1. Let's assume this to be simply linear in the position operator. These coefficients d's are simply just some numbers and can be considered to be an ordinary matrix. Applying the derivative to this, we have, which is just the matrix element dKi. This is a square matrix since both its indices run over the same three spatial directions. Notice that we have once again substitute in the full magnetic field B since the uniform part doesn't contribute anyway. Let's work out some essential properties of the matrix D. To do this, we need the Maxwell's equations, which must be satisfied by B. These are the equations for the vacuum case, since we are assuming that the source of the field is nowhere near the path of the atom. We claim that the vanishing of the divergence of B implies that D is a traceless matrix. This is apparent by direct calculation. Let's write this divergence like so. And using our earlier equation, this is just the sum of the diagonal elements of D, which is its trace. And the first Maxwell's equation says this must be zero. The second Maxwell's equation implies that D is symmetric. Again, this is easily seen by direct calculation. The curl of B can be written using the Levi-Civita symbol. Then substituting for the gradient of B. This last equation holds for any value of the free index J. And because the epsilon symbol is anti-symmetric in all its indices, this implies that D is a symmetric matrix. So for the magnetic field B to satisfy the Maxwell's equation, the matrix D has to be both traceless and symmetric. Now we can substitute this into the equation of motion. Since D is just a matrix of numbers, we can pull it out of the bracket. Next, we plug in the expression for the magnetic moment. The term on the right carries information about the electron's orbitals. This is encoded into the atom's trajectory on the left. Thus we see how the stern galak setup reveals the internal structure of the atom. Here, the fact that D is small will be important. This means for this bracket on the right hand side, we can ignore the effects due to B1, since we are only calculating stuff up to the first order in the small quantities. So for the state psi of t in this bracket, we can drop B1 from its time evolution. Therefore psi of t on the right hand side evolves approximately by h0, which includes the magnetic effect of only the dominant field B0, which is uniform and much easier to deal with. But bear in mind that this approximate state on the right is not exactly the same as the state on the left, underlying blue, because this state has to include the first order perturbation due to B1 
in order to balance both sides of this equation. Maybe we should indicate that this is a zeroth order state vector to avoid confusion. Let's plug in the expressions for mu and b0. Remember that j3 is the only operator in this term, the rest are just numbers. The kinetic energy term describes the free motion of the center of mass, let's label it hcm. Notice that H0 is the sum of a center of mass operator and an operator that is internal to the atom. They commute with each other. Therefore, the time evolution generated by H0 can be factored into two independent parts. One governing the evolution of the center of mass motion, and the other, the evolution of the internal electron orbitals. We can now substitute this zeroth order state vector into the right hand side of the equation of motion. Since J is an internal operator, this CM evolution operator should commute with it, and cancels with its inverse. Now only internal operators are left within the bracket of the initial state psi. Let's choose this as the initial state. The internal state is the electron's J sigma orbital, while the CM state is some wave packet that describes the starting position of the atom. The reason we focus on such states is that these form a basis for the electron orbitals along any axis, not just the z-axis. And since the Schrodinger's equation is linear in the state vector, solving the time evolution for these basis states automatically tells us how any state would evolve in time. Now substitute this into the expression above. The CM state simply factors out, since all the operators are internal. And we are just left with internal operators acting on internal state. And even better, these operators are acting on their own eigenstates. Therefore, the state J sigma is just multiplied by a phase. This cancels with its complex conjugate. and the time dependence simply drops out of this expression. Even though we allow the component of j to take any value, the bracket with the j sigma state actually constrains the first and second component to be zero. So this bracket effectively selects the third component of j. This is so because both j1 and j2 can be expressed as linear combinations of the ladder operators j plus and j minus. We have discussed this in details back in lecture 20. Therefore, any diagonal elements of these operators in the basis of the J sigma states must necessarily be zero. Of course, the remaining bracket is just the eigenvalue, H bar sigma. Let's plug this result into the right hand side of the equation of motion. Applying this delta symbol, the index k is set to 3. 
This equation describes the time evolution of the average position of an atom which has the initial state above. With its electron in an orbital with the quantum number sigma that is projected along the third axis. This information is encoded into the average position due to this choice of the dominant uniform part of the magnetic field. Now we look at the state psi of t on the left hand side of this equation. For the time evolution of this vector, we need to consider the full Hamiltonian where the effects of the non homogeneous field B1 must be included. At least to the first order, such that the right hand side of the equation of motion can be balanced. Let's plug in the full magnetic field in the yellow box into the interaction term of the Hamiltonian. Using the expression for the magnetic moment, the first term is H0 which just includes the dominant B0. This is separable into a center of mass part and an internal part, and is used in the evolution of the state at zeroth order approximation. The last term of H contains the non-uniform field. This couples together an internal operator and a center of mass operator. This is the interaction that is responsible for correlating the internal electron state with the center of mass motion of the atom. In such a way, we are able to deduce the internal structure of the atom by observing its trajectory. Let's give the average position a more descriptive notation so that we know the information it carries about sigma in the initial state. This new notation for the average position can then be used to label the state at time t. In the same vein, since psi cm is just a wave packet used to describe the initial position of the atom, let's write it this way, where x0 is the average initial position. Of course, let's not forget that this is not a position eigenstate. It also carries position uncertainty, which is not written explicitly. Because the time evolution operator is unitary, the inner product of states at time t with sigma and sigma prime must be the same as the initial states. And assuming the orthonormality of states, we have These two equations allow us to describe the stern galak experiment. But before we go further, let's make one more simplification. Let's require that the deflection of the atom's trajectory to occur only along the third axis, which is orthogonal to the initial motion of the atom. This will allow us to distinguish the different trajectories with different sigma in an optimal way. This implies that the coefficients d3i must be proportional to delta 3i. But is this setting allowed? Recall that to be consistent with the Maxwell's equations, the matrix D has to be both traceless and symmetric. The requirement in the red box means the element d33 is not equal to zero.
and the tracer's condition then requires either D11 or D22 to be non-zero in order to cancel D33 in the sum. And to satisfy the delta symbol in the red box, the easiest way is to let all the non-diagonal elements be zero. This is also consistent with the symmetric condition. From here on, we shall assume the condition in the red box and that D contains only diagonal terms. There is also an important issue we need to address. As we have mentioned earlier, we cannot simply assume that the initial electron orbital within the atom is oriented along the z-axis, because this would suggest that the z-axis is somehow special even before the atom enters the magnetic field, which has a dominant component in the z-direction. Somehow, the atom knew about the magnetic field beforehand. Such an assertion would be unphysical. Therefore, the initial orientation must be arbitrary. Note that we call this a spin state just for convenience. Of course, this includes the electron's orbital angular momentum with respect to the nucleus. Spin is just a generic word to mean the total angular momentum of the electron. Such a linear combination of sigma in the red box could then represent a state with arbitrary spin orientations given the quantum number j. The time evolution of such a state is straightforward once we have solved the evolution of the individual sigma states. Since any state must satisfy the Schrodinger's equation, which is linear in the state vector. Here we remind you again that these sigma states are not position eigenstates, but wave packets with position uncertainties. Its label, x sigma, is just the average position of the wave packet at time t. And its time evolution is described by the trajectory equation. Here's how we actually measure sigma. At time equals tf, the atom will reach the screen at the end of its path. It will then be in the state psi tf, while the screen will be in its initial state capital M. M for measuring device, as the screen is effectively dead. At this point, the states of the atom and the screen are not yet entangled. We can label each sigma wave packet by their final average positions, x sigma. A short interaction occurs between the atom and the screen. The screen then takes its final state, recording the final position of the atom and becomes entangled with it. The readings are the z positions on the screen, which differ for different values of sigma. The measurement of sigma occurs when the end states of the screen become distinguishable with respect to sigma. Since the screen is a macroscopic body, it cannot therefore be in a superposition of distinguishable states. This breaks the superposition, and the entangled state between the atom and screen reduced to a product state again. This has a definite sigma value and occurs with a probability given by the absolute square of the associated amplitude. For fixed j, this has 2j plus 1 possible outcomes. If you are wondering, why is there this strange rule that forbids the superposition of orthogonal macroscopic states and what defines a macroscopic body anyway? See lecture 6, which is all about quantum measurements. All I will say here is this, for all practical purposes, all the instruments and all the experiments that have been done up till now can be considered macroscopic. With this as a rule of thumb, the results of all these experiments are consistent with this principle of superposition. For now, let's use it until it breaks. Thus what ultimately determines the value of sigma and its axis is the measurement. 
the sensitivity of the screen to the different end positions relating to the different sigma values reduce the state of the system to only the allowable possibilities. This is how the stern galak experiment verifies the theory of discrete orbitals within the atom. However, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's use the spin-half two-level system as an example. The wave packet of the atom diverges along two separate trajectories as it travels through the magnetic field and ends up around two possible spots on the screen. The upper spot corresponds to spin up along the z-axis and the lower spin down. Where the atom is found depends on the associated probabilities, which is determined by the initial state. Note that the wave packets of the two trajectories are actually in superposition, it is not one or the other, before they reach the screen. If the wave packets associated with the different sigma values are well separated, then we can measure the sigma value of the atom unambiguously. For this to happen, the separation delta x ray must be much greater than the spread of the wave packets. The measurement would be inconclusive if the overlap between the two is too large. That is, we could not deduce the value of sigma from the recorded statistics of the positions of the atom on the screen. The fact is, wave packets do spread with time, even in the absence of interactions. This is simply due to the uncertainties of their initial velocities, and with the magnetic interaction in our case, we wonder if this would increase or reduce the spread. If it increases the spread, then this effect would then compete with the increase of the separation of the wave packets with time. So whether the experiment succeed or not depends crucially on this point. Therefore we had better calculate how the spread and the separation evolve with time under magnetic interaction. This is what we shall do next. We start with the trajectory equation. Let's now study the time evolution of operators and switch to the Heisenberg's picture. For the moment, let's hide the time dependence to simplify notations. Recall that earlier, we have made some assumptions about the matrix D that are consistent with the Maxwell's equations. This simplifies it, as we are able to set all the off-diagonal elements to zero, leaving just the diagonal ones, which must satisfy the traceless condition. Most relevant to our experiment is the deflection along the z-axis. The fact that d is diagonal means that we only have d33 on the right-hand side. And this implies that the deflection along the z-axis only depends on j3. But this is not the only deflection. The traceless condition implies that at least two of the coefficients d have to be non-zero. Let's choose d11 to be zero, which means no deflection along the x-axis. Since the screen is not set up to measure deflections along this axis anyway, but we would still have an additional deflection along the y-axis. From the looks of these equations, things seem to be symmetric about these two axes. On top of this, the screen could also measure deflections in any direction on the y z plane. In principle, we would like to measure sigma, which is the projection of the internal angular momentum of the atom, along the z-axis through its correlation with the deflection of the atom's trajectory along the same axis. And we thought we could do this by applying a magnetic field along the z-axis. Now it seems unclear what we are actually measuring. But this is so because we are only looking at the equations of motion of the operators. Things will clear up once we take the state vector into consideration. For now, let's focus on the deflection along the z-axis.
We have to reinsert the time dependence because later on we shall represent operators at t equals zero as without time argument. To solve for x3, we need to first solve the time evolution of j3 on the right hand side, which is again governed by the Heisenberg's equation. But since d is considered a small quantity, which we only keep to the first order, we then only need the time evolution of j at the zeroth order in the small field b1. That is, we can just replace b in h by b0. This is the same argument we have used earlier. Let's solve this equation of motion for all the components j, k, since we will also need it for j2 to evaluate the deflection along the y-axis. We can write h0 as the following. Where we have introduced the parameter omega. This has the dimension of angular frequency, as you can easily check. Mu times B0 is energy, divided by H bar is frequency. The quantum number J is dimensionless. This will turn out to be an actual frequency, as we shall see. Inserting H0 back into the equation of motion, and remembering that HCM is actually the kinetic energy operator of the atom, which commutes with the internal angular momentum JK. We have We can see right away from this commutator that J3 is constant in time. But let's work this out for arbitrary components. We would need the rotation algebra, which must be satisfied by all components of an angular momentum from the same time. This is discussed extensively in lecture 19. Let's look at how each component of J evolves in time. J3, as we have just mentioned, is constant because the epsilon symbol is zero for two indices with the same value. And for the rest, Let's apply the fact that J3 is constant to the equation for the Z deflection. This equation will turn out to be the most relevant to the experiment. And furthermore, it has a simple solution, since it is just like the Newton's equation for constant force, other than the fact that we are dealing with operators. Let's save this for later. We shall first deal with the XY components of J. At first look, it appears that J1 and J2 will oscillate into each other with time. Let's work this out in details. We must first decouple these two equations. Start by taking another time derivative of the first equation. For this term on the right hand side, we can then substitute in the second equation. And we end up with an equation just about j1. Now do the same for the second equation.
These are just the equation for the simple harmonic oscillator with the angular frequency omega. So we are right about omega after all. This is known as the Lamorse frequency, and it describes the precession rate of the magnetic moment around an applied magnetic field. In our case, this is the dominant field B0 along the z-axis. Therefore, only the perpendicular components are rotated with time. The solutions for J1 and J2 can be expressed as linear combinations of these two independent solutions. Of course, these coefficients are all operators and can be determined by the initial conditions and one of the equations above. Only one of them is independent, since it is these two that implies the simple harmonic equations, which gives us these solutions. Let's start with the initial conditions. J1 at t equals 0 is equal to J1, which must also be equal to A1 plus B1, according to the solution, giving us this relation. Similarly for J2. Let's set these two equations aside. Now we apply the relation between J1 and J2 from the equations at the top, starting with the first. Taking the derivative of J1, we have According to the right-hand side of the equation in the blue box, this must be omega times J2. Let's equate the coefficients for the solution Ei omega t, and we have followed by the coefficients for the solution E minus I omega t. Thus we now have two more equations relating A1 to A2 and B1 to B2. These four equations will allow us to solve for the four unknowns. Let's write A2 and B2 in this equation, in terms of A1 and B1, using the equations in the blue boxes. The two red boxes can be solved to give us A1 and B1. Recall that these two terms in brackets are just the ladder operators J- and J+. From these equations, we can then use the blue boxes to find the corresponding A2 and B2. Now substitute these coefficients back into our solutions. Let's apply this to the deflection along the y-axis. We can ignore the x-axis since we have assumed earlier that there's no gradient of magnetic field along this direction, and so no deflection. Let's now solve this equation. This is a second-order non-homogeneous differential equation due to the right-hand side being some function other than zero. First we find a particular solution, 
That is, some function which when plugged into the left hand side will reproduce the function on the right. This is easy, since the right hand side is just a simple harmonic function which has the property that when you take a double derivative, you simply get back the same function multiplied by the negative of the square of its frequency. Therefore, m times the particular solution is just minus 1 over square of the frequency multiplied by the function on the right. Next, we need a complementary solution to the differential equation. This is the solution of the homogeneous form of the equation with the right hand side set to 0. This equation is easily solved by direct integration, which gives us two constants of integration, c and d, that are both operators. The solution is a general linear function in t, since its second derivative must be 0. The sum of these two solutions will give the general solution to our differential equation. Plugging in the complementary solution into the left hand side gives us zero, while the particular solution gives us the function on the right. Let's now determine C and D using the initial conditions. At t equals 0, the solution becomes x2. This is equal to setting t equals 0 in the expression above. From the definition of the ladder operators, this term becomes Thus we have determined C in terms of known operators. Next we solve for D using the first derivative at t equals 0. This is just the initial momentum divided by the mass of the atom. We get this directly from the Heisenberg's equation of motion for x2. This is equal to the derivative of the expression above at t equals 0. Again, we can rewrite the ladder operators in this bracket. This implies d equals Now with the two blue boxes below, we have the operator x2 as a function of time. This will allow us to solve for the amount of deflection along the y-axis as the atom moves through the magnetic field. To proceed, we still need the state vector of the atom. Let's assume that its spin state is arbitrary. This will allow us to make an unbiased comparison with the z-axis deflection later. Note that this is both the atom's initial state and its state for all times since we are in the Heisenberg's picture. Changes in the system with time are all carried by the operators. So most of the work is already done in the expression above. Let's evaluate the average value of x2 with respect to the state psi. The key point to note is the time dependence of this expression. There's a term linear in time and two oscillatory terms. Let's rewrite the spin state in a more compact notation. <laughs> 
This expression will give us the average deflection along the y-axis for an atom in the state psi. Let's solve for all the brackets on the right-hand side using this state, starting with C. From the equation in the first blue box, we have This separates neatly into a center of mass term and an internal term. We can simplify these notations. The initial average position of the atom can be set at the origin, so the first term is zero. Thus we have the average of C. We shall worry about the spin average later. The average initial momentum of the atom is P0, which is assumed to be along the x-axis. We need this to evaluate the average of D. Specifically the first term. Note that all the time-dependent terms are first order in a small quantity d. Therefore we can see that the average y deflection is entirely due to the gradient of the magnetic field. The linear term shall dominate as time passes since the oscillations can only occur within fixed bounds. Recall that these oscillations are due to the precession of the atom spin in the uniform magnetic field B0. So we can drop these terms. And we are done with the y-axis. Let's save this result and move on to the z-axis. But first, let's review our initial conditions. These shall be used throughout our calculations. Let's solve the equation of motion for x3, which we have obtained earlier. This is simply the Newton's equation for constant acceleration. And we can simply use the standard solution, which can be obtained by direct integration, where the operators a and b are the constants of integration. Again, we can determine these constants by using the initial conditions. Now the first derivative which is the velocity along the z-axis, p3 over m. Taking the derivative of the solution and setting t equals 0, we have a. And we have the x3 operator as a function of time. Let's calculate the average deflection along the z-axis with respect to psi. Using the expression above, we have From the initial conditions, these two terms are zero. We end up with an average deflection along the z-axis that is first order in the small quantity, but quadratic in time. The reason we get this quadratic power is due to the non-zero constant acceleration in the Newton's equation. Let's compare this with the deflection along the y-axis from earlier. Notice that this is just linear in t. To make a proper comparison of the z-axis deflection, we know that the 1 over omega factor in front is of unit time and is in fact the precession period of the atom spin in the uniform magnetic field. 
which we denote by tau omega. Now we can compare the two time factors. The z-axis deflection will dominate if t squared is very much greater than tau t. This corresponds to the condition of omega t being very much greater than 1. This means if the atoms spend enough time in the magnetic field, such that its spin makes many periods of precession, then its z-axis deflection will dominate over the y-axis. We can thus focus on the z-axis. Note that we could have arrived at these equations purely from classical physics. Since the Heisenberg's equations of motion are identical with Hamilton's equations from classical mechanics, the terms underlying blue will then be just classical variables rather than the averages with respect to a quantum state. We shall examine this classical and quantum connection more thoroughly in a later chapter. Now let's look at just the dominant z-axis deflection. From the classical perspective, this is how we would treat the internal angular momentum of the atom. J would take values in discrete units of h-bar, as proposed by the bohr sommerfeld model. The stern gulag experiment was designed precisely to verify this model. This was still before the 1925 breakthrough of Heisenberg, before the full quantum mechanics was born. During the time of the old quantum theory, when physicists thought that the strangest things about the quantum world is that things can take discrete values. Therefore these values of J were seen as initial conditions, which means the atoms came out of the oven already carrying these values. This is not so from the quantum perspective. The quantities and brackets are statistical quantities with respect to quantum states which may not have definite values for sigma. Rather, the screen determines sigma indirectly by measuring the z-position of the atom, at which point the atom takes the final state, psi j sigma. These states are the individual components of the initial superposition. When their z-positions are sufficiently well separated, so as to be distinguished by their interactions with the screen, the coherence will then be broken, and a single sigma value emerges by the associated probabilities. We are now ready to demonstrate these statements in a quantitative way. First we work out the z-axis separations of the psi j sigma wave packets. Note that we have encountered this average before. Thus we have the average z deflection of a sigma wave packet. Let's consider the separation between two adjacent states. As we have said before, this separation has to be very much greater than the position spread of a sigma wave packet along the z-axis. In order for the screen to distinguish the different sigma values and reduce the initial superposition to a definite sigma state, let's now calculate this spread, which is defined as the standard deviation. Note that the second term is the average z position raised to the second power. We must drop this term since this would be the second order in the small quantity.
and to evaluate the remaining term, we would need the square of the x3 operator. For this, we can use the earlier solution. Note that this expression is just the sum of an internal operator and a center of mass operator, which must commute. Therefore, we could just use the usual quadratic expansion formula to evaluate this square, taking care to keep the small term up to only the first order. Now we are in the position to answer the question whether the spread of the wave function along the z-axis could depend on the magnetic interaction. This first factor in the square of x3 seems to suggest it does. But let's verify this by actually calculating the spread. We would need to take the bracket of the square operator. For the first term, its operator content are just these two in the blue boxes. Let's take the bracket of their product. With respect to the state in the green box, These brackets factor into an internal and a center of mass part. The center of mass part is simply zero due to the initial conditions below. As a result, the whole term is zero. Therefore, the bracket of the square will just depend on this last term. This term is quadratic and is not necessarily zero by the initial conditions. Again, we can argue that as t becomes large, this first term will be dominant. So we may drop the second term. This is equal to This term is the initial momentum spread of the atom along the z-axis since the average momentum along the same axis is zero. Let's compare this with the separation of wave packets. We can see that the z-separation between adjacent sigma states increases quadratically with time compared with the linear rate for the spread. And therefore the separation will dominate over time. This is exactly what we have hoped for. It means that if the atom travels long enough in the magnetic field, the value of its spin projection along the z-axis could be measured and the initial state psi will then be reduced to a definite sigma state. These form the discrete points that were observed in the stern galak experiment. If you like this video, consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel. And remember to press the notification bell so that you'll know when a new video is ready. See you next time, and thanks for watching.